I'd like to introduce Vilika Vendrick from the University of California, who's going to talk about apprenticeship as a research method. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Caroline and Kasia and Wendy uh, for organizing this wonderful conference. Uh, I always say that giving a lecture is a performance, but after just now, I don't dare to say that anymore. So um, this was wonderful. Uh, I want to talk to you about apprenticeship as research method in relation to experimental archaeology. And I want to play the devil's advocate here because I think we have a problem. How long does it take to learn a craft? So I checked. Length of apprenticeship, start of the age of learning, uh, the type of technology that's learned is, of course, relevant. Uh, the country that this takes place, and I put in a reference so you can check it, that I'm not lying. Um, five years does it take to learn pottery in Kenya, and the age is about 16 to 18. Uh, and I'll get back to this in a moment. Then in Cameroon, it will take you about four to seven years, and you start somewhere between six and ten years old. It's quite a small child. Um, in Egypt, in Fayoum, where I work, potters start around six to eight years old. Um, sorry, the length of apprenticeship is six to eight years old. Uh, potters say they start at 12, but that's because they officially have to go to school, and they don't always do so. Um, so I would take that age with a bit of a doubt. Then in uh, Niger, it's um, eight, year, eight years of apprenticeship, starting at seven. Um, we have textual evidence for uh, the apprenticeship for Renaissance painters, uh, which took 13 years and started at the age of 12. And I just want to come back to the first one, the five-year apprenticeship starting at age 16 to 18. Uh, these are potters who learn potting from their mother-in-laws after their marriage. Those are patrilocal uh, societies where children are not taught to teach pottery because um, women first move to the village of their husband and then they learn pottery making from their mother-in-law. And that brings me at one of the most important parts of apprenticeship. It's not just about learning a craft, it's enculturation. A lot of it is becoming a human being. Uh, a lot of it is learning social laws, social uh, ways of behavior. Uh, and that's why uh, this, this patrilocal uh, situation is very important. Um, you learn how to fit in a particular society in addition to learning a craft. And then us. Half a year, when we start at 22 when we do our PhD project. So how can we pretend to uh, be skilled if we try to do experiments? And a couple of you already noticed this uh, or apologized for it. A couple of you have been working for 30 years uh, on their craft. Um, so, uh, but it is definitely something we need to keep in mind uh, that what we try to do with experimental archaeology might go wrong just bef because we're not skilled enough. Um, so if you conclude that something doesn't work, uh, then the conclusion is actually it doesn't work for you. Uh, and it might have worked in the past. So if I use experimental archaeology in teaching, um, I, I teach classes on uh, technology, ancient technology, um, what I tell my undergraduate students is just try it out. Play with material. Just get to get, yeah, try to get a feel for a material. Uh, and you can call that exploratory experimentation, or you can call it experimentation, which is a kind of uh, experience slash orientation. Um, the graduate students are getting more serious about this. I really want them to develop a research question uh, and devise a method of testing that question. Uh, for instance, look at the validity of a reconstruction. And we've heard a couple of examples of that in the past few days as well. Um, and very important, their work has to provide a link with the archaeological record. Now, 
so what do we want to learn through experimental archaeology? It helps to us to understand the chaîne operatoire. We've heard this term as well a couple of times. Uh, the material properties. Um, we're looking at technological possibilities and difficulties, uh, and we can test our technological reconstructions. Um, and I will get back to this in a moment. I want to go a little bit into the question about our reconstructions. Um, because we can be very smart persons, but if we don't think in a technological or in a crafts way, we might go quite wrong. Um, this is a type of basketry found in Egypt. It's also found in Israel. It doesn't occur in Egypt really before the greco roman period. Um, and you see it's a plaited basket. Uh, and you can see these lines here. There's strings running through the fabric. And I'll show you a reconstruction of this basket um, by Yadin in his 1973 publication of the Cave of Letters, uh, where he reconstructs the plaid pattern. And he notices that there's this string sort of worked into the edge. Um, and then he continues um, his reconstruction of how this would have worked. Uh, and it's quite a complicated technique where you have to sort of fiddle with those plaiting strands, uh, sort of turn them around the bit of string. Uh, you have to open up the edge of the plait to be able to do that. He says that if you have to make a strong curve, uh, you sometimes have to do two strands uh, through the same hole around the string. Um, and when I read this, I thought, well, he hasn't really looked around at what is happening nowadays in the world. And I just want to show you a bit of video. Um, because a reconstruction of how things could have been done doesn't necessarily mean that's the way they might have been done or, or the way they were done. Of course, the last part we never know for sure. So we're trying to switch to the DVD. And you're going to check if it's still awake. The DVD goes to sleep. Yeah. Oh, okay. it's awake. OK. And I'm not going to give any commentary, apart from saying that, it's a, that this film really looks at things in parallel to ancient material. Leaflets of the date palm have been split into strands of about a centimeter and a half wide. The strands have been soaked in water for half an hour and are being used to make a long plait. This is the first stage in making a basket. I don't know if I can Mohammed is plaiting with nine strands at a time. In plaiting, all strands can be considered as active elements, that is to say, all strands have the same function in making the fabric. The plait pattern is under two, over two. 
Under two, over two. <laughs> Making short leaflets into a long plait requires inserting new leaflets at regular intervals. <laughs> Nine meters long is the plait that Mohammed has made. The size of the basket depends on the length of the plaited strip. By now, the palm leaf has dried out and the plait has to be soaked in water before the next stage can begin. Otherwise, the strip would be too brittle and too stiff to handle. Even the hard veins of the date palm leaflets are used. While the plait is soaking, Mohammed starts making string. The two small bundles from which the string is made can be considered as two active elements. They have an equal role in giving the string coherency.
By sewing, the edges of the plait are drawn firmly together. The edges fit together like the two sides of a zipper. The fabric thus seems to be made of one ongoing plait rather than a long strip which has been sewn spirally. Because the string is mobile, it is the active element. The plait, being in a fixed position, is the passive element. This reddish brown material is the fiber that surrounds the base of the date palm leaves. <laughs> After a brief period of soaking, five minutes is sufficient, the fibre is ready to be used. A string made of two strands is anchored between Mohammed's feet. A third strand is inserted separately. The third strand is the active element. This palm fiber rope will be used for making the rim and handles. <laughs> Usually, Mohammed works in front of his house. Even though he has moved to the roof for the occasion, family and friends come and go to have a chat. 
This is usually the case, but even more so if a foreigner with a camera is around. Thanks. Um, so, as you saw in uh, this part of the film, um, this is not really the way these baskets are made. It's, it's not a complicated way of trying to plait and, and work in a piece of string, uh, but it's actually a long plait that is sewn together. Uh, but if you just look at the fabric, um, the, the way this was constructed, that's what it looks like superficially. Yes, there it's again. Um, so in Egypt, um, in, for instance, Kasseri Brim, you have round baskets, you also have mats uh, where the strips are sewn parallel to each other. And we actually have pretty good archaeological evidence that this is indeed how these things were made uh, in, in plaits with different color strips. Um, now, Mohammed, who you saw in this film clip, um, was someone I apprenticed with, you could say. Um, and I found it was the best way of getting in touch with him, in spending time with him, in explaining why I wanted to work with him. Um, and he was extremely willing to explain every detail of what he was working and why he was, why he was doing this. And from the film, you can also see that, that uh, we're very comfortable around each other. That was the added benefit. So apprenticeship as a research method works quite well uh, because the lack of experience that I had, which was a complete lack of experience in making baskets, uh, was made up by his uh, extensive experiment, experience. Um, but also the fact that I came to him and asked him questions and spent time in the village um, meant that I really appreciated him as a craftsperson. And that appreciation is, is a very important base of getting that exchange of thoughts. Um, there was a direct reason to ask all those questions that I was asking, uh, and, and he completely understood why. Um, and he gave me homework. Actually, he's climbing here in this tree to, to get me some palm leaf to take back to the dig house in Amarna uh, to work on my own because I wasn't spending enough time with him, he thought. Uh, so I would never learn it that way. Um, but of course, if you work with a craftsman, he'll tell you when something is going wrong. Um, but the other thing it offered was the opportunity to bounce off ideas of him. So I would show him um, ancient things or I would show him photographs uh, and ask him about how he thought something was done. Um, and this worked really well. The one moment where it went wrong was uh, when it appeared that uh, he thought that I wanted to learn this craft because I wanted to become a basket maker in the Netherlands. Uh, and when I explained to him that I couldn't possibly do that because there were no palm trees in, in the Netherlands, uh, he was really shocked uh, and, and he pitied me and he said, how can you live without palm trees? <laughs> and if you see what happens in Egypt with palm trees, you, you can understand his reaction because it's not just basketry, it's rope, it's uh, that the palm trunks are used, it's used as fuel, 
Paul has ex extensive experience with hacking up palm trees for his kilns. So uh, the stuff is everywhere. The other caveat is that sometimes craftspersons can have very fixed ideas. Um, so they might say, no, it can't possibly have been done like that because that's just not how they do it. Um, so you have to keep a critical mind and find people to work with who have a very open mind themselves. And if I talk about apprenticeship and ethnoarchaeology, uh, that doesn't have to take place in Egypt. That could as well take place in the US or here in England. Uh, the, the whole idea is that you work with someone who knows what they're doing. Um, now, if you look at apprenticeship worldwide, you'll notice that there's a number of stages in learning a craft. Um, and I just mentioned 10 here. Uh, there, there's different divisions, there's different opinions. Uh, but mostly it starts with just being around a production sequence. And usually this happens in childhood. Uh, in many cases, it's a generational thing. So the father teaches the son, the mother teaches the daughter. <laughs> Um, and children are around the production all the time. Uh, and usually it starts with doing supportive tasks. So you carry things, you put things away, you clean things out. Um, there's a lot of observation involved. And then there's imitation involved. You start trying things out. Uh, and then apprentices are allowed to uh, produce simple forms. Um, often that's the only sort of official learning procedure in the whole apprenticeship uh, where people are actually being corrected. Um, and that slowly grows and slowly is really years. I mean, it, it might take four years making simple forms before you are allowed to do something more complicated. Um, so you can do more complicated forms. Uh, adding decoration is typically something that happens later on in apprenticeship. Um, during this whole period, you do learn the secrets of the trade, often also step by step. Um, and then you re are get incorporated in the entire production sequence. So you're allowed to do every part and, and you're part of the whole production. Uh, and your responsibility grows slowly uh, during your apprenticeship uh, until you are an independent producer. And as I said before, apprenticeship is about learning a craft, but it's also about enculturation. And it's very importantly about enculturation. Now, as an outsider, as someone who comes in late uh, with a different set of questions, as an archaeologist coming into a workshop, uh, you mostly are concerned with observation and imitation, maybe. Sometimes, if you really spend a good amount of time, you can get to one of those further stages where you actually get to do stuff. Um, but you only do a very small part of the whole sequence. Um, and if you're lucky, you get to learn the secrets of the trade. Uh, and I just wanted you to show you those different stages. Um, children just sit around uh, and, and see in this case, their grandmother making, in this case, baskets. Um, and very small children are involved in, for instance, unloading the kiln, putting things in place, clearing out stuff. Um, and, and we do have evidence that this was going on in ancient Egypt as well. Um, this, the tomb of Pepe Andre in Meir, uh, and we see a young boy carrying around stuff for people who are working. Uh, and, and this is definitely not the only depiction. Uh, we have evidence of those more formal stages, stages of apprenticeship as well. And uh, I really like this little statue from Amarna, uh, where Thoth, as the master, uh, depicted as a baboon, is sitting there overlooking his apprentice, the, sh the, the scribe. And, this shows a little bit that there can be very different ways of apprenticeship, ranging from very informal, mostly family-based, to very formal structured, structured learning periods. But most of all, apprenticeship is really about feeling your way through material and feeling your way through a production process. Um, and I found this photograph online. Um, 
And I, I, I love it because it's really the big hands trying to show the small hands what to feel, which reminds me of this relief um, of the tomb of Min, Tibetan tomb 109, where the prince is being taught how to shoot a bow and arrow. Uh, Min is the teacher, the prince is the later king, Amenemhat II. Uh, and, and you see how he holds his body and corrects it and gets him in the right position. So if a craftsman say, uh, let me show you, actually what he says is, let me make you feel, let me um, give you that experience on, on what it should feel like. Um, which brings me to what you actually learn in craftsmanship or in apprenticeship. And I think what you learn is dexterity, skill, and endurance. Um, where dexterity are the right motions, where skill is the right motions in the right order. Um, skill means that you actually know what you're doing. And endurance uh, is repeating those motions for a lengthy period. And it's not for nothing that you start, if you're a potter apprentice, with very small pots, and you make many of them. Because it, it's also simply physical power, just the, the having muscles to do a certain motion, uh, to, to be able to do it for a long time because most of the crafts um, have periods of very long repetitions, rep repetitive motions, um, which really feeds into working rhythm. Uh, if you want to maintain those repetitive motions for a long time, um, it's very important to work in a rhythm. Uh, and that all links together, the, the, just the power of your muscles, the right gesture, uh, the right attitude, uh, both physical and um, sort of the social attitude. Um, and it's intrinsically linked with theoretical knowledge, which uh, we've heard it before these three days. You can learn from books, partly, uh, but it's so closely connected to what you do with your body uh, and, and the way you use your body as an instrument uh, that it's, it's really difficult to split those two. Um, I tend to call it body knowledge uh, because it is so physical, uh, but there's a lot of different terms and there's a lot of different thinking about um, what this is exactly. So Gilbert Ryle in 1949, uh, key to term, terms knowing that and knowing how, to explain this difference between sort of the theoretical knowledge or book knowledge and, and this body knowledge. Um, Michael Polanyi calls it tested knowledge. Uh, it's something that's very difficult to express, very difficult to put in words. Here, this, I'll make you feel, com comes back. Um, and then, um, Marcia Ann Dobras calls it techne, which she says is the, techne in, in the original sense, the unification of art, craft, skill, methods, knowledge, principles, and understanding. And basically what we're slowly developing is a kind of epistemology of craftsmanship. Uh, and we're working on, on a book, The Archaeology of Apprenticeship. Um, and Lisa Bender Jorgensen writes a chapter in that on the epistemology of craftsmanship. Uh, because with those different types of knowledge also goes a very strong social opinion of what the value is of different types of knowledge. And that's something to keep in mind. Um, what you learn uh, in experiments, in apprenticeship, uh, is really how to work through the chaîne opératoire, the production sequences uh, that are sort of the theoretical makeup of uh, a production. Um, so I put it on the producer's side. Uh, I also put consumer in there because uh, influence on what is produced and how it is produced is often very much consumer driven. Uh, so changes in the production sequence uh, can come from the production itself, but often come from requests from outside. Um, and chain opératoire is, is, I would call it a method. It's not really a theory. It, it's, um, as we heard already, it, it was keyed by La Roi Gourand. Um, to go beyond looking at an object as an object, but really think about how this object came into being. Uh, and all those different stages of how that object came into being 
uh, have moments of choice. And those moments of choice are very much culturally determined. Uh, so there is where we can begin to see traditions, cultural changes, cultural differences, uh, innovations. Um, so I just want to go through these quickly. Um, What you see in basketry, which is the material that I know best, uh, is that selection of the raw materials and the preparation of the raw materials is what takes by far the most time of the whole production process. And it's not only true for basketry, it's true for pottery. If you don't know uh, your material, if you don't know where to get it, um, there's a lot of experimentation that, that has to happen to get the right amount of clay. Um, preparation of the clay is a lengthy process. I'm sure it works for flint as well, just collecting the right flint, uh, same story. Um, the shaping is the stuff that really stands out mostly, that that's really what determines the picture of a craft. So we were talking about tomb scenes uh, in Egypt and basically what is shown mostly there uh, is the, the face that has the most repetitious moments. So in basket making, it, it's, well, there's actually no scenes of basket making, but mat making, it's the actual weaving, for instance. Um, and then the production sequence, uh, the production details, I mean, uh, are where you find most of the secrets of the trades. Um, so with basketry, if you really want to understand the tradition, understand innovation, understand, understand learning, uh, you have to look at the things that are the least visible. You have to look at the edges. You have to look at how material is, new materials incorporated in the product. Uh, things that are not obvious. Uh, and mostly things that you can't get from observation and imitation. Uh, but things that you really have to get from learning from someone. Um, so here is um, just an illustration of preparation of the raw materials shredding of palm leaf to start a basket. Uh, and I just want you to show a couple of those edges uh, which, which are the critical moments in the whole process. That's really where you begin to tell that um, there's a tradition going on. And as we also heard before, uh, the best archaeological objects to see this in are the things that are broken up. Uh, complete objects are a curse. <laughs> we have these beautiful round coiled baskets made in Middle Egypt nowadays. As I said, the working rhythm is really important. Um, one of the things that you can do by working with modern craftsmen, uh, and especially by using video, because it, it enables you to, to see things multiple times, uh, is to look not only at, at the production process, but also at the rhythm of the whole thing. And the reason why there are quite long sequences in the basket film I showed you was because there you can find those rhythms. You can hear them, actually. Um, and what I found as a correlate to the archaeological material is that skilled basket makers have a very regular working rhythm and that translates in very regular work. Um, of course you have professional skilled basket makers and non-professional skilled basket makers, part-timers. Uh, both of those will have a very regular working rhythm uh, but professionals also have sort of an enhanced speed. So skill is rhythm and speed. Um, often professionals make more mistakes than non-professionals. At least that's what I find back in basketry, uh, where they just work so fast that they will stitch a little bit next to where they actually wanted to stitch. But even those mistakes are then very regular because it all happens in this rhythm. So we looked at the things we learn through experimental archaeology. Um, the chaîne opératoire, very important. 
how does that production sequence take place, uh, the material properties. One of the reasons the sound was loud with the video is because you could hear the swooshing of all the different materials. Um, the technologi technological possibilities and difficulties that, that you run into, uh, and very importantly, to test our reconstructions. But ethno-archaeology, and again, I don't mean this as taking place that necessarily in a different culture. It can be right here in Swansea. Um, helps us to understand different things. For instance, the Chen Operatoire is a complete construct, our construct, uh, and that it's really our attempt to organize a reality that's much more messy. Um, also, that our reconstruction uh, is just one out of many more possibilities. And the more things you look at, uh, the clearer that becomes, and the easier it becomes to think outside the box. Um, technological change is often consumer driven and we'll look at some examples of that in a moment um, and it will be very clear in whoever you work with that technology is socially embedded. So we have these beautiful baskets in Middle Egypt and I just put a turkey in because I like animals um, and they are made specifically for bread. So here we see these women baking bread and there's this basket that's the right size to contain uh, these large Middle Egyptian flat breads. Um, these baskets are about this big. Nowadays in Amarna you can buy baskets this big, same kind. It won't fit your bread at all, but it does fit a Samsonite suitcase. <laughs> So, consumer-driven technological change. Um, when I did fieldwork in Nubia, I found something really interesting. These were all people who were resettled from Nubia when the Aswan Dam was built. They were all settled north of Aswan. Um, and there were two groups of villages, the Kanzi and the Fadidja. Um, they speak two different languages. What I found was that the Fadidja villages desperately were looking for their original material, the material with which they were used to make their baskets. So they were looking at dome palms, seeing if they could find dome palms in the vicinity, and, and they're quite rare, so they had a hard time getting their materials. They also used colored straw, so I put this example in. You, you can buy these gorgeous baskets um, in Aswan. Most of these are made in the 60s. Um, so they use the traditional materials, the traditional colors, the traditional methods. The Kansi villages, on the other hand, had this attitude, we can't find dome leaf, we'll just use something else. So they use cotton and washline, or even samba bar wrappers. Um, so the attitude of craftspeople towards changing circumstances can be wildly different. Um, and again, that's something to keep in mind when we interpret the ancient material. Um, so, to conclude, I think that experimental archaeology improves markedly when you combine it with ethnoarchaeology. Now, I know there's very few mummification going on nowadays. Um, but still, there are, uh, and, and I know that you're com conversing with butchers regularly, there, there are, of course, things that work uh, and, and where you can really profit from people who have insights of the work that they're doing on a daily basis. Um, so, uh, the reason why this is so important is that you make use of existing e experience rather than uh, try your unskilled hand at things. Um, you gain experience in the process uh, with someone with uh, a good open mind. You can really share the, your research questions um, and, and there can be very fruitful corporations uh, on research on ancient materials. And it helps you to consider all factors that are involved in ancient technology. 
um, in production decisions, most of which I would say are not technological. Um, so that whole complex, that whole world that is linked to our objects, to our material culture, uh, that comes in with the production, and of course I don't even talk about consumption and discard and, and, and use and reuse, um, but that whole complex we, we have to draw in. Uh, it's, it's part of the living objects. Um, so the combination of experimental archaeology and ethnoarchaeology, I feel, is vital. Thank you. Question was in the video of the basket maker, what were the brown fibers? These are the leaf sheath fibers of the date palm. And it's used, I, I didn't show the whole sequence, but it's used to make the rim of the basket because it protects the rim, especially against goats. Um, it's also used to make the handles. Yeah. Sorry, did you say what? The leaf sheath fiber of the date palm. So, so you have the date palm, uh, there, there, it's a feather palm, so you have these enormous leaves yeah. with uh, small leaflets on the side, uh, and, and that's encased in a leaf sheath, and, and that fibers up. So, so that, that's this very, very brown fiber. Yeah. Anybody else? question is whether I've come across uh, the concept of contracts, and you mean apprenticeship contracts? Yes, so that people are, are in return for learning how to do something from a master craftsman, they are, are bound to give a certain number of years service in return before they go off to independent craftsmen and competitors. Um, the model you describe, where, where people uh, sort of learn with a master, uh, and in exchange uh, say they will work for certain years for the workshop before they go off on their own, is a very medieval uh, model of apprenticeship and I haven't come across anything like that in Egypt. Uh, the thing that comes closest to uh, sort of formal apprenticeship in that way uh, is training to be a scribe. Uh, but, and I look at my colleagues, I don't know of any um, sort of set ups where, where you are taught to be a scribe and then have to stay uh, with the temple for, for a certain while. Most of the apprenticeship in ancient Egypt I'm sure was quite informal, where, where you would learn through generations. But if so, what's in it for the master if they're training someone to be a competitor in the marketplace? What's in it for the master to train someone if he might become a competitor? Well, mostly it's family-based, so, so you have families of potters or family of basket makers, so it's just the next generation, and they'll feed you when you're old, hopefully. <laughs> so that, that, that's what's in it for them. Yeah? Um, I just wondered in your book if it might be worthwhile looking at um, models of teaching and learning, so to try and apply educational ideas to the apprenticeship. So there's the model of coal, Um, the, the contribution is <laughs> that whether I would look at uh, a couple of um, recently appearing books on uh, learning by example, I, I would like to get those references. Um, I've, I've looked into that and I actually was looking for someone who was willing to write uh, sort of a cognitive psychology type of approach of learning, of, of physical learning, and I couldn't find anyone who was interested in doing that. So I, w I would be... Okay, let, let's chat. <laughs> Okay. Uh, and, and Beck and Gons in the Royal Stables in Luxor, how many years did he spend? Uh, I think it was five. Five years to, to, to... And you can actually work out his age. 
Right. Yeah. Yes, that, that would be really interesting. Thanks. Kasia. Did you find in the different villages that the social sort of networking that goes on in that change also in the, the down to the two villages where they dealt with the material differently with the social networking? And the, the question was, did I find in the two villages with this very different approach to uh, materials and in innovation, whether the social network was different as well? Um, mostly, one of the questions I asked was, uh, are you a better basket maker than your mother? Um, and, and if so, why? Um, and I think the whole attitude towards tradition uh, was, was quite different also in, in the answer to that question. Uh, because in the Fadija villages, um, there was this great admiration for, for the parents and um, especially the mother. It was a mother-daughter uh, relation. Um, so uh, the girls would say things like, I, I hope to be as good a basket maker as my mother, which sounds very much like a socially required answer. <laughs> Um, in the Kenzie villages, I actually had girls say, oh, I'm a better basket maker than my mother. And then I said, why? I said, well, I make new um, uh, decorations. I come up with new colors. So, uh, so yeah, the, the, the whole attitude there was much more towards innovation. And, and it definitely also worked socially, yeah. Any more? Now, if we have one... We have still five minutes, okay, because I want to show something uh, to you, uh, sort of coming back to this Beni Hassan discussion that we had. Uh, I just want to look briefly at the mat maker in the tomb of Getty, um, because Ross, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was Grace Crowfoot who wrote about this scene, um, saying that this was a really strange rendering of um, a mat maker, a mat loom, uh, and it couldn't really be right because, uh, first of all, he was sitting on his mat and that would disturb uh, the tension of the warp yarns. Uh, here he has this beam to sort of slam the, um, the, the, the weft so, so it, it, it's well closed. But the things he had woven were on this side, so that doesn't make any sense. He should weave on this side and then <coughs> tighten the weave by pulling this rod. Um, and the, it, it's, it's a good representation of, of a ground loom, a horizontal loom. You have four pegs in the ground, ground with two cross beams with the warp going across and then you have the weft. Um, but so she concluded there were some problems with this. Uh, and then when I looked at this basket maker, um, she does support herself. So, so she has a beam across, she sits on the mat, she has the material that she's about to weave lying on this side, ready to put in. Uh, here she's actually weaving, but then she would sort of pull this in. Uh, the loom is the same type, four packs in the ground, two cross beams, warp, weft. So that's why I said, I think Benny Hassan is pretty, they, they did pretty uh, observant artists there. So that, that was just one thing I wanted to add. Thanks. Yes.